Good evening. We are so happy and proud to welcome you tonight to the People's Inauguration. Woo! Yeah. So this looks like a very rowdy bunch. <laughs> uh, last year was Barack Obama's inauguration. This year is the People's Inauguration. Um, we organized this event to really have uh, open up a space for critical dialogue. We feel like dialogue is very important in this moment, right? Yes. Um, we have a super powerful program prepared for you this evening. We're here to commemorate the one-year anniversary of Barack Obama's inauguration. And we're also here to celebrate the release of Khalil Al-Mustafa's book, From Auction Block to Oval Office. Yeah. <laughs> So we, I, I realized we didn't necessarily say who we are. I am Khalil Al Mustafa. Yeah. And I am Julia Almada Grove. And, yeah. and we are presenting this event this evening in coordination with MVMT.com. We are streaming live online right now as we speak. So if you have people sitting at home, text them. We are a. Uh, a electronically friendly um, <laughs> performance space this evening. As you'll see, there's fully integrated media. And we are going to be running Twitter feeds, Twitter conversations going on during this. If there's something that comes up for you, feel free to Twitter it with the hashtag Dear Barack. Um, and this is, we'll speak a little bit more about that later. But before we. Um, so, so we have a, a dynamic panel, um, and we have an excellent moderator. The panelists all have their own areas of expertise uh, and contributions. We really selected people that uh, could really add something powerful to this conversation. Uh, you want to bring up our moderator? Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Elizabeth Mendez Berry. Yeah. Elizabeth Mendez Berry is a journalist. Um, she is the author of The Obama Generation Revisited, an article that was the cover article of The Nation magazine on November 23rd, 2009. Um, her articles have appeared in The Washington Post, Vibe, The Village Voice, Smithsonian, and Time, among many others. She is also her, uh, the recipient of ASCAP's 2006 Deems Taylor Award for Music Reporting for her article on domestic violence in the hip hop industry. Elizabeth Mendez Berry. Uh, at this point, I take it away. And so I'm going to be introducing tonight's panel. And first of all, just so you all know, the format for this evening is poetry and dialogue. And in our first segment, we will have readings from the 100 Poems Collection followed by responses from each of our four panelists. I think you may know who some of the panelists are. Our first panelist is Michael Skolnick, who works with Russell Simmons and has worked uh, with people within the White House recently. Michael Skolnick. <laughs> and he's available later on this. No, joking. Um, Rosa Clemente. Hip hop activist, vice presidential candidate with uh, Cynthia McKinney last year. Come on down, Rosa Clemente. And our next panelist is Reverend John Vaughn, who's the program director of the 21st Century Foundation and an ordained Baptist minister. And our last panelist really needs no introduction, but I'll give it a shot anyway. She is Cindy Sheehan, and she is a revolutionary. All right, so we're going to go right into our first segment. And actually, before it, let me tell you that the second segment will be a dialogue between the four panelists, and we'll conclude with a Q&A segment so that you all can ask questions. Um, so let me welcome Khalil Al-Mustafa to the stage. Thank you. 
days one through seven, from auction block to Oval Office. Along with millions of other hope-filled Americans, I tune into America's latest reality television show, Black Prez, from auction block to Oval Office. Martin would celebrate this victory and in the same breath speak out against injustice. I can hear his voice trembling, comparing the bombing of children in the West Bank to four little girls and an Alabama church. From the pulpit, he would say, keep marching, and we would listen. The dolls are coming, the Obamas. Collect the whole set. Michelle, Barack, the kids, the dog. Limited time offer you could own your first family today. <laughs> I hope Barack Obama's presidency will help my family accept my wife. Maybe they will be able to imagine the possibility of a genuine black, white love relationship. There is no memory of fire hoses in Barack Obama's DNA. No memory of women moaning at the bottom of slave ships and the crowds of millions gathered. There is no evidence of my parents ever being here. I am a survivor who dares to be a witness. Today I woke up with that Barack Obama swagger. I kissed my wife, scanned the day's news, hit my desk without missing a beat, greeted everyone by their first names, flashed smiles, shook hands, and dished out low fives when appropriate. I negotiated every encounter with, yes, but how about this, and got my way. At the end of the day, I came around secret service, picks and shot jump shots left-handed, came home, played with my kids, and made sure my lady went to bed with a smile. This was no election. This was a pep rally for imperialism. Well, that was quite an introduction. So our first panelist to respond is Michael Skolnick. He is the political director for Russell Simmons, as well as the editor of globalgrind.com, and he has worked with the White House during this first year. Please give us your response to the first series of poems. Well, uh, Elizabeth, thank you, and thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor uh, to be on this panel. I'm not sure if I deserve to be up here, but uh, I'll definitely uh, take the time to, to speak. You know, I was at the White House yesterday. I just came back from D.C. this morning, um, and so there's, a, and, and I think, um, and I also traveled to Haiti about 30 times over the past uh, five years. So there's a lot in my mind that I'll try to process. And so I think a lot about the Haitians as we have this um, discussion. Um, and then I was in the bathroom and I heard Tupac. And it's like, it's like no more like, you know, Muzak in the bathroom. It was Tupac <laughs> in the bathroom at WNYC, um, which is great. Um, and, and I think a lot about hip hop. And I think um, when I was 14 years old and growing up in New York and, and having um, some pretty incredible parents who um, always taught me about respect and, and respecting other people. And, and I remember there was a rally in, in, in DC um, for the National Organization of Women. And I said to my brother who was 16, I said, we're gonna go. You know, we're gonna get in a bus and we're gonna go. And um, it was a, uh, a pro-choice rally. And it was at the mall. You know, and, and it was on, at the Lincoln Memorial. I thought that's where Martin Luther King gave his speech. I have a dream. I got to go there. And I think we convinced our parents that we were going to, you know, to, to a, a Knicks game or something. And uh, we ended up getting on the bus and going to Washington and sitting in the mall um, and listening uh, to these incredible. And I remember uh, Marion Wright Edelman speaking. I thought, I want to be her one day. I want to grow up and be just like her. And then fast forward uh, many years later and sitting at the mall um, and waking up um, with my brother and his fiance at the time and my girlfriend and my best friend from California and walking at, at 4.30 in the morning uh, after going to a Bobito event of a Stevie Wonder party the night before in DC and going to the inauguration. 
um, and, and sitting in the mall uh, without a ticket, um, but with some uh, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and some hot cocoa and uh, waiting for the president to uh, you know, give his inauguration speech. And I think from a young person's perspective and from you know, the hip hop generation, there was so much enthusiasm that first day. There was so much uh, anticipation that first day. Um, and yes, uh, like my good brother uh, said, uh, this idea, this reality show, this idea that you know, we're selling Barack Obama dolls. And I remember it being at the inauguration, like there was, I don't know if I can swear, there's shit everywhere. <laughs> like you can buy this at Barack Obama, you can buy this, Michelle Obama's. And I was like, oh my God, what did we come to? Um, but there's so much positivity and there's so much love and there's so much excitement. And, and I went to the White House yesterday um, to talk uh, with some folks in his administration about youth violence. Um, and I was at Darren Albert's funeral uh, in November in Chicago, the young man who was killed at 16 years old. And I sat with his family. And three days later, I sat with the mother of Kevin Miller, who was a 13-year-old kid shot in the back of the head in Queens. Um, and it sort of brought us back to reality, um, that even though we have someone in office um, who um, has a lot of potential and has great intentions, and um, is the best thing I've ever seen. And I've only been alive for this long, but the best thing that I've ever seen. Um, yet we still have incredible, incredible challenges uh, that we face as young people. So, so I am, um, at this point, uh, I am inspired. I'm still inspired. Um, because as young people, we did something. Whether we like it or not, we did something. We got involved. We said, we are going to make our voice heard. And yes, a year later, we discussed this in the green room earlier, a year later, um, there is definitely a different uh, attitude amongst young people. Um, but I do believe, I do believe that we are antsy. I do believe that we want things to happen quickly. We want Guantanamo Bay closed now. We want the war to end now. There are things that we want to happen now that haven't happened, and they are disappointing. But as young people, we have to remain engaged. We have to be just as excited as we were at 4.30 in the morning. My poor girlfriend who was thinking to herself, I'm not going to make it to 11 o'clock. It's 22 degrees outside, but we're going to do it. We're going to wait and we're going to hear this man speak because it'd be just as great as when JFK gave his presidential inauguration or FDR gave his presidential inauguration. Um, I want to hold on to that excitement and remember that excitement of day one of day two, when he said, I'm going to close Guantanamo Bay on day one. I want to push the president to do the things that we want him to do and, um, and, and, and keep going. Uh, we're only one year in. We've got at least three more. Um, so uh, I'm inspired. I'm still inspired. And I, and I challenge my, my peers uh, to, to remain involved and remain inspired. Um, oh, uh, we're actually going to go. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> There is a black woman in the White House. There is a black woman in the White House. We have a first lady who finds a humble pride at hearing the name Sojourner Truth, has wept while reading the color purple, and laughed at coming to America. Grandma, I try to honor your American dream. You instilled in me the basics of citizenship. Reading, writing, learning, voting, paying taxes and bills on time. Home ownership and community service. I pay my taxes on time, Grandma, you'd be proud. I have your passion for something more. I have read and wrote and learned and built my own home of citizenship educated and willing to fight for justice. Grandma, I hope this is your American dream fulfilled. Our president's number one lieutenant, counselor, consoler, nutritionist, doctor, coach, confidant, instigator, motivator, partner, magician, voodoo priestess, conduit for tears, holder of fears, when the twin power fist bump homegirl could say, brother, get your act right in five different dialects, Michelle Obama, <laughs> our secret weapon in the White House. <laughs> this mocha brown girl stands across the subway platform from me, her almond eyes muted. 
dimmed by a world which hates her as hobby. She speaks through Michelle Obama's face on a wordless button she wears over her heart. I am still not proud of this America, though sister, I am proud of you. I know you were fabulous before the world had the opportunity to meet you. And if this country took another 250 years to recognize your existence, you would still be all the way fly. Today is grandma's birthday. She was a conservationist before it was considered cool. She could get more cups of tea out of one tea bag than government stimulus packages can get stimulation out of corporations. Since I was born, I believe black women can control the weather. So I know our first lady is cool sunny days, warm breezy nights, and heat waves and hurricanes if she has to. The next panelist has her own button. Her name is Rosa Clemente. <laughs> She's a hip-hop activist and journalist, and in 2008, Rosa, alongside former Democratic Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, ran for Vice President of the United States with the Green Party. She was the first woman of color, it was the first woman of color ticket in American history, and she was also the first Latina in the history of the U.S. on the Vice Presidential ballot in over 30 states. Please give us your response to the series of poems dedicated to the First Lady, Michelle Obama. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing about Michelle Obama is that um, no matter what, you know, last year at my own election party here in New York, you know, when they walked out, that was a moment. And that's what it is, a moment. And where we're stuck at is emotional response to a moment that happened a year ago. Um, all I can say about Michelle Obama is I think she's amazing for what we've been allowed to see and we probably won't be allowed to see much more of what is probably her radicalism on some issues. Um, so to me, the bigger picture is like this year later, where are we, especially as women of color? We're not in leadership position, we're not running for office, and when we do, we're whited and blacked and browned out of the media. And particularly, you know, for hip hop, to me, it's, it's funny that the generation that ushered in the president was also a generation that's grappling with its politics right now. When you have hip hop Republicans, that's a problem. <laughs> when you have all hip hop activists, 99% men with over a million dollars, that's a problem. I don't want, you know, no offense to Russell Simmons, but I don't want him to be the voice of the political generation. Because you know what, we need a voice I would say the same thing about Reverend Al Sharpton, you know, but we're talking about particularly hip hop politics. Look, we're at a point where giving the president excuses has to stop. He ran for president. He knew what was up. It's been 365 days, you broke every promise. I'm not willing to wait. How long do we wait? How long do we have to be nice? How long do we wait for people to rewrite the history of what is happening? How long do we wait for 5,000 more troops to land in Haiti? What is happening in Haiti right now is this President's Katrina. Because if it wasn't for the Haitian people, he wouldn't have been able to run for president. His people would have never been free. Mm -hmm. And to hear this silence is disgusting. To see George Bush is disgusting. It's a slap in the face of people dying right now. Right? Mm -hmm. So. We have to get away from the emotional response of how we feel right now, how we felt a year ago. Have the material conditions of working people in this country changed? Hell no. They've gotten worse and worse. No health care. You said single payer, now you don't want single payer. You said transparency, now you're not gonna let the healthcare debate be aired on C-SPAN. You said you stopped the drones, you've doubled up on the drones. You said you wouldn't send troops in, you're sending troops in. You keep sending 100 million, if not more, to Israel on a daily basis and that's the only money you're pledging to Haiti? 
it's not only trying to speak truth to power then, it becomes then what has happened since the Barack Obama election that we as people in the movement now must organize. We've had racial reconciliation where particularly white people feel good about voting for a black president, but we don't have racial social justice. And when you don't have social justice, I don't care if you want to be my friend, I don't care about living in Flatbush next to you, I want the ability to eat, walk, and not worry about my man getting shot on the streets. Mm -hmm. That's what racial social justice entails, along with everything. So, you know, it, it, it's time for particularly to get out our mindset out of a two-party system. Do third parties have problems? Sure. Does the Green Party have problems? Sure. But at least the Green Party has no problem saying we believe in an end to war. We believe the people of Palestine should be free. We believe in reparations for Native American and reproductive rights. And by the way, um, President Obama, we actually stand by our statement that LGBTI people who want to get married should be able to get married. At least there's a party willing to do that. So now it becomes incumbent on us. A president is only going to do so much. JFK didn't do nothing because he felt bad for black people. He was forced. LBJ didn't sign a civil rights bill because he was nice about black people. He was forced. They assassinated Martin Luther King after he announces the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. All of this is a trajectory to the history of where we're at now. And you know, particularly as a hip hop generation, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in the amount of men who call themselves activists, who called me and Cynthia's run scandalous, stupid, dumb, who chose to spoke about our breasts or our, our sexuality on blogs. Um, you know, and one year ago they were preaching about racial social justice. They got caught up in what a lot of us got caught up in, which is the $750 million marketing campaign called the Barack Obama presidency. Mm. On that note, <laughs> Khalil. <laughs> um, days 15 through 24, grab your bootstraps and pull your pants up for black men who could have been named Amadou. Amadou, if only you had been from Kenya and not from Guinea. If only you had sold hope on TV screens instead of socks, gloves, and videotapes on New York City streets. If only those four cops could see your commitment to change instead of a gun, this world might see your name and think of hope. A group of Brooklyn boys rap about pulling their pants up I cannot help but smile. What would Mr. Cosby say now? <laughs> I find myself looking at black men with different eyes, thinking things like, act right, fool. Don't you know we got a black president? I take Barack's success and failure personally somehow. I feel as if I represent him as much as he does me. My father's funeral was one year ago today. Not that I remembered. The calendar on my phone told me this. It simply reads, 10.30 a.m. funeral, with no more description. Not father, not dad, not Henry. No address, no directions. I have questions for him, which he only answers in his absence. Would you be excited or full of bitter resentment each time Barack's smile flashed across the TV screen? Would this black man moment give us a language to speak? I walk down boulevards of broken black men, a hall of mirrors which haunts me. Barack. You know you as a magic Negro. With your cool, calm demeanor and your smooth walk, 
but only we can call you that, and still, never in public, and only from the mouth of the late Richard Pryor himself. <laughs> Look, Colin, I don't think the guy at the pearly gates is gonna say, hey you, with the pants hanging down, you're going 30 flights down. You, the man who helped the son of Satan rape and pillage a sovereign nation, you go to the upper room. The pants down kid might get a pass on that God looks after fools and babies claws, or he might be damned to an eternity of pants pulling up, wandering through space and time, not much unlike his life now, but chew, <laughs> they got special places for you, son. I can't help but wonder, will young black boys one day be gunned down on Barack Obama Boulevard? Barack Obama Boulevard, wow. Okay, the next panelist to respond is Reverend John Vaughn. He's an ordained Baptist minister, and he's the program director of the National Public Foundation, the 21st Century Foundation. One of, the in of its initiatives is the Black Men and Boys Initiative, which addresses the root causes of problems facing black men and boys. Please give us your response to this series of poems dedicated to black men who could have been named Amadou. Thank you so much for the, the poem. It was interesting to hear it after having read it. So I have some random reflections. They may not necessarily hold together in prose. You really can't pull yourself up your boot straps if your straps are cut and if your boot is worn out. When I was reading the poem and hearing it again, I heard the voice of my mother. And my mother said to me, you know, there are consequences for everything that you do in your life. Whatever you choose to do, there are positive consequences and negative consequences. And you need to be ready to live with those consequences or to be able to follow through on whatever you choose to do. The, the pull up your pants, I, I think it's a red herring. But we live in a world of paradox, and I think it's important to acknowledge the paradox, the paradox between self-expression and the paradox between the practicality of mainstream. And there's a line that is different for many of us. There is oftentimes the ways individual responsibility is, is very easy to focus on but yet it's harder for us to really embrace the real systemic issues. What are the negative consequences? What are the negative things that happen to negatively impact black men and boys? Community organizers talk about the world as it is and the world as it should be. And oftentimes organizers like to live in the world as it is the practical every day, what can we change today, but we have to be challenged to not let go of the world as it should be. And I think one of the challenges for this president is who I think oftentimes lives in the world as it is, in the practicality of how do I get the deals done around the things that I think that are important, but I feel has let go or is gradually letting go in some places of what the world as it should be that there are some things that I think that are worth fighting for. Reverend Al Sharpton likes to oftentimes repeat a phrase that Dr. Martin Luther King repeated, which was, are you going to be a thermometer or are you going to be a thermostat? Are you just going to measure what happens or are you going to be ready to turn the heat up? There's an image that one of my colleagues has of a postcard with Barack Obama's face on it with the words, make me, which means that we cannot stop organizing. The fact that he has been elected has not all of a sudden changed things for people. 
and certainly as one who works at a foundation that's committed to black people, it has not automatically changed things for black people, as we get reminded each and every day. We have to continue to organize. We have to continue to advocate. We have to make him. It's also as interesting to come to this tonight after, I grew up in Massachusetts. <laughs> and so, but in some ways it actually wasn't that surprising to me. I mean, in some ways it was more a testament to the power of the Kennedy family to in many ways hold sway in many ways over the political machineries of Massachusetts. But in some ways it's not surprising. Um, but it is certainly a wake-up call about the importance that you cannot stop organizing, is you cannot stop being about civic engagement. I'll end with this. I was, uh, the two, there were two people who came to mind. My uncle, who died about 10 plus years ago, Waverly Jones. He would have loved this day. He was a consummate Washingtonian. Grew up and born in Tarboro, North Carolina, emigrated to DC. He would have loved this moment. And my son, James Waverly, who was at the inauguration with my wife. I didn't go, it was too cold, too many people. <laughs> but who went with my wife. And, and what it is then the leader that he will be and that he will need to be to make this world a better place for himself and for his grandchildren and the call to action for me as his dad. Days 26 through 39, dirty draws on the White House lawn. Who do we complain about now that the man is a brother? <laughs> a 14-year-old girl dies in the desert while walking alone to the Estados Unidos. No Liberty statue to greet her, offering to change her name from Joselina to Rebecca. She tells her little brother to walk ahead without her. He needs to be with Mama. And Joselina dies alone in the desert, an American. I do not think America is the best. And continuously telling me how bad it is in other countries simply will not convince me. <laughs> if our soldiers' hearts could Twitter. Would we follow their moment-to-moment -moment updates? Being an American is like having an abusive lover who beats you and beats you and beats you and then buys you nice things. <laughs> Last week, on the subway, I witnessed a middle-aged, business-suited white man laughing and joking with a young hooded, fitted cap black man who actually took one of his headphones from out of his ears. Is this the Barack Obama factor? Did black folk get a promotion? Or maybe white folks got demoted? Either way, I like it. This is good. She says Barack is her boyfriend. And I already know how this one goes. When a woman is this much in love, you better not speak bad about her man. She will shut you down, call you a hater, and stop returning your phone calls. <laughs> so when she calls you to brag that her man shut down illegal torture prisons, do not dare mention the others that he missed or suggest he find the culprits guilty. She may hang up the phone and never call you back. And this last one is for Betsy, mother, mother-in-law. If America 
were a kid in kindergarten, would we tell her to share her crayons and stop eating all the cookies? <laughs> would we tell him to stop to play nicely and stop being such a bully? At what point would we tell America to go sit on the carpet and take a time out? <laughs> All right, the next panelist galvanized a peace movement. Her name is Cindy Sheehan, and she is a Nobel Pri Peace Prize nominee known for her protests for peace against former President George Bush. She recently led protests at Martha's Vineyard during President Barack Obama's vacation stay and during his acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize. Her speech, It's Time for the Anti-War Choir to Start Singing, is included as a history-making speech in Voices of the Pe People's History, edited by Howard Zinn and Anthony Arnov. Please give us your response to this final series of poems. Thank you. Um, Kalilia, it is much different listening to you re read your own speeches, or I mean poems, than to read them. It, some of them just have given me chills uh, hearing you say them, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I said a couple weeks ago, I'm going to be in, in New York City this week. Uh, does anybody have anything for me to do? And it's only been about 95,000 things this week. So, <laughs> And I burned my tongue. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. I'm suing them. They're paying for the revolution. <laughs> so, yeah. How appropriate, huh? Um, yeah. Wow. My response to the poems and, and to the first year of the Obama administration is, first of all, I proudly supported a ticket of color, and that was Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente. And not, not because they were women of color, but they're women of courage and integrity. And that, they, that their platform resonated with, with my platform. I ran against Nancy Pelosi in 2008, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I lost. But um, I, didn't, I didn't vote for them because of any white guilt or white angst or anything, but because they're, they truly are sisters who care about people who care about community organizing, who care not just about Americans, but people across, across borders, knowing that a strong America is one that is not invading other countries, is not bailing out banks, is not denying its own citizens basic services. And when that happens in our country, the rest of the world is healthy also. Um, unfortunately, Barack Obama kept at least one promise and that was to send more troops to Afghanistan. And now he has doubled, doubled the commitment that George Bush had in Afghanistan. And he's broken his promise to bring troops out of Iraq. There are more contractors in both countries than there are troops in, in either country also. And like uh, Rosa said, he's escalated the immoral and illegal drone bombings, especially uh, the CIA bombings in Pakistan. So that's my, my concern, of course, as a peace activist, is that I never stopped. You know, I was never one that said, oh, let's give him a chance. Because it's not about Barack Obama, it's about the system. And the system is a military industrial complex, media industrial complex, Wall Street, you know, all of the, it's a corporatocracy. And that's what we have to get young kids to realize, that it doesn't matter if we have a, like, um, I think it was Andrew Coburn who said, doesn't matter if it's an idiot from Texas or a smooth-talking black man. It's the system, and we have to realize that it's the system, and we need to organize young people outside of that system because the system is inherently corrupt. And when you get involved in it, I think it doesn't change the system, it changes you. And I think that's what is happening here, is no matter what good intentions you have when you start out, the system corrupts you. And it's very hard to resist that kind of, that, and that level of corruption. Now, I'm very, um, 
active on my Facebook. I have 5,000 friends. And, and that's just my own my page. I have a fan page for my radio show, Cindy Sheehan Soapbox, and all the activities I do. I was just kind of joking around today, but it kind of picked up steam. I said instead of being involved in the so-called two-party system, that's just really a corporatocracy in a one-party system, it always has been, a lot of people after yesterday are saying, I'm leaving the Democratic Party. I said, well, it's about time, because that party left you a long time ago. And... And so I said, why don't we start the pot-smoking hippie party, <laughs> clothing optional. And, what, and, and that, would be, that would be like the anti-party, the party party, you know, where, where we just drop, we, we just like get high and drop out. I'm allergic to it, so, to, so pot-smoking is also optional with, along with the clothing. And so, and so what a wonderful way to say, you know, we can create our own healthy systems. We don't need a president. We don't need a Congress. We just need each other. And so I want kids to organize around that ideology, not a two-party corrupt political ideology. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for their great responses and to Khalil for such beautiful, beautiful words, uh, which I believe you can pick up. I'm sure you can, you can pick up copies outside and you should pick up copies outside. So we're going to segue now into our conversation with the, the panelists, with, with each other. Um, but before we do that, I just want to take one quick show of hands from the audience, which is how many of you one year ago today felt an emotion you hadn't felt about politics before? Hands in the air. Okay, whether it was good, whether it was bad, you know, okay, it was, and how many of you since then have felt some kind of disappointment? Okay, so we're going to talk about how to articulate those critiques with some very, very thoughtful people, clearly with different perspectives, um, but who are all figuring out ways of, of positing an alternative um, at the same time as being... Uh, uh, continuing to participate, let's say, because that's one of the biggest issues. One, one option is you stop participating, which I think many of us do in frustration, and then the other option is to continue, but maybe in a different way. So I want to start off by talking about, um, jumping off on what Khalil said about not talking bad about her man. Because a lot of people feel about Barack Obama like, they date him, they know where he lives, they know his, I mean, they know his wife, but they feel like they could take her, you know, things like that. So people have a really strong emotional attachment to this guy that I think most of us haven't witnessed with other political figures. At the same time, we do have these criticisms. So I wanted to open it up to the panel and ask you all, how you navigate those emotions, which are very real, and I think a lot of us have different versions of them, and at the same time, how you're able to bring a critique. And I think a lot of you have done this publicly, some of you are doing it more privately. So please jump in, whoever feels like starting it off. I think that, um, so a lot of our work is, I work with a foundation, and so a lot of our work is grant making, and so we're funding, ranges of organizing, advocacy, and leadership development. And so, you know, one of the things that we, I think, attempt to do is to, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter who's in the White House. And I'd really pick up, I think, on a point that Sister Cindy had shared, which was, you know, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. You, you know, we've got to be about organizing and building some power. And so, you know, part of my hope, through at least the work that we do, and try to encourage is try to encourage try to encourage folks to channel that whether they feel still feel that sense of pride that sense that something is different you know into well we can't just you just can't sit back and wait for it or he's not going to do it for you or do it for us that there's got to be ways in which we that that gets channeled in a way to 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 make him do some of the things that we said that he said he was going to do and we want him to do um, as, you know, power concedes nothing. And so I think that's, so I think it's been important for us to, in our work is, 
is to say to folks, you need to channel this in a way, not just sit back and wait and take it, you know, but there are, um, there are places where we have to engage and we may have to create some new vehicles because some of the vehicles that exist, you know, aren't working for us. And so that we've got to maybe create some new organizations, create some new tables, create some new places, create some new ways to, to civically engage, to, to be about civil disobedience. But, um, but we've got to be engaged and we've got to be active. And are you seeing that? I'm seeing some of it. I mean, I think that there are, I think that there is, I've seen at least in a lot of the black communities that we've been investing in that there is this new sense of possibility. I think there is a, you see this interesting um, among our folks, the mixture of the inside-outside strategy, because there, there are some for whom are in the administration or no folks in the administration or two or three degrees separated, but also at the same point understand there has to be this outside strategy. So there is this, there's this inside-outside dynamic and not always harmonious, you know, but you, there is clearly an inside and, but there is, there is also this sense of all of a sudden there's a sense of access for better or for worse, whatever comes with access that folks felt like they just didn't have, right? Like you couldn't, like you were shouting and it didn't really matter because you didn't really exist for the last eight years for a lot of these groups. Rosa, would you like to add anything? Because I know that you're someone who's been very vocal about your critiques of, of Barack Obama and at the same time also you know, recognized some of the reasons why he's important. Yeah, I don't critique Barack Obama. I'm critiquing the Democratic Party that he leads. You know, mm -hmm. And I think that's, the, the, that's where we're at, particularly as folks of color. You know, um, but I also think that there's a lot of people organizing, right? And like a perfect example is the Tea Party movement. I don't care what people say. They've taken every strategy out of the 50s and 60s handbook. They obviously at some level, of course, have white privilege that if you get youth of color, there's going to be a, a slightly different response or anarchist, mm -hmm. there'll be a, a, dis, a different response. And I think that's one of the things, right? Like when people do try to engage in Congress, what's happening? They're getting arrested. You got to get a permit. Um, when you have a rally, you got to deal with the police now. You got to negotiate. You got to sit in this block in this thing. What they've done is is police state movement. You know they've 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 done that, and so it bothers me when a lot of people say, "Well, it's up to us to hold them accountable." Well, every time we do, they're arresting us, shutting us down, imprisoning us, keeping us out of the media. You know, we have so-called progressive media like the Huffington Post. Give me a break. Why don't you just say at this point you're moderate and you have access to the White House and you want to keep that going? You know, we have organizations, you know, and, and there's a great article called the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. And that's part of the Barack Obama win, too, that you had a lot of these nonprofits who say they're nonpartisan, but a lot of foundations, if you look at who runs them, these are Democratic fundraisers. So, campus progress, really? Just say you're a Democratic front for the Blue Hawks. And the, you know, you're not going to invite a Cindy Sheehan. In fact, you'll disinvite a Cynthia McKinney to your future events. So all that has to be taken into consideration. What that means for us is we have to figure out a way of getting ourselves out of this two-party mindset and getting out of a mindset that a federal election is going to change. The system needed a Barack Obama at this point or it was completely going to collapse. So in saying that, it just tend to finish this point, in saying that, it now becomes incumbent on us, once we get out of that two-party mind frame, not to necessarily think that voting changes everything, but to particularly civically engage now at a very local level. Yeah. Right? Like here in New York City, <laughs> Patterson today announced he's giving $25 million back to the MTA student cards. Whoopee, they need 214 million. What do you think, 24 million is going to pacify a million young people? I hope it doesn't. I hope that at least 10,000 young people decide it might be time for us to stand up because when they're taking away our ability for poor people to go to poor schools anyway, what is that? Well, Children's Defense Fund tells us that's the right straight school to prison pipeline that we're seeing for young people. So, 
we need new innovative ways, but we also need a way of coming together around a politic that we can all engage at. And so um, on the one thing that I was thinking about was just because there is this unique emotional attachment that I've certainly witnessed with Barack Obama, um, even getting to the point of the policy, I feel like you have to get past those initial conversations where there are so many people who just feel like I can't even talk about a critique here right now. And Michael, you've worked more closely with the White House, and I know there are people who are there who have frustrations and concerns. Can you speak a little bit about how those are being discussed there? Is that something that people are being open about? Because obviously not everything they're doing is working. Well, I think rather than discussing you know, what's happening inside the White House, which I'm not there, so I don't think it's fair for me to discuss how they feel. Um, I think it's beyond an emotional connection. And I think, I think it's almost unfair to call it an emotional connection, because, especially for young people, because young people came out in record numbers to get involved, forget voting right. for the president. Before the vote even happened, they came out in record numbers to get involved, say, oh, what is healthcare reform? Oh, what is going on with this beautiful woman's son was killed. Where this, what's going on over there? Or what's going on in my community that I sort of overlooked before, but now I'm being challenged to look at? And to me, that's not an emotional connection. That's empowerment that young people are having now. And, and, and a year later, as we have these discussions, and of course we're all frustrated. Of course we want more. I want more. Of course. But when we do this, we point two at them and three at ourselves. And I start to question myself, what am I doing? Forget what the president is doing. You know, he lives in a big house in a big city It's far away from me. What am I doing? Am I doing enough? And I have to ask myself that question. Am I doing enough to stop the violence in my community? Am I doing enough to get jobs for young people that are unemployed? Am I doing enough to get young people out, out of the, the cradle to prison pipeline? What am I doing? Now, I have plenty of critiques for the Republicans and the Democrats. But I'd rather critique myself and have self-reflection for me and channel that energy to then push myself to become more engaged and become more empowered and then next time or ne tomorrow do more. And so just to clarify with the emotional point, I mean, I think I, not to trivialize by any means, you know, the youth participation, because certainly in my own research I found that young people weren't just getting excited about his charisma, they were getting excited about learning how to commu organize within community. And that was something very, very new for them. So that's definitely, um, I, I, I feel you on that. I think my thing with the emotions is that there is a sense of ownership that is complicated, that is worth talking about, I think. It's mm -hmm. challenging. I mean, people so, think they can call Barack Obama, because that's, that's part of his appeal. Right. Like, you feel like if I see Barack on the south side of Chicago, you know, yeah, I want to hang out with him. You know, and particularly for people of color, they're still at that response because you can't, 400 years of, 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 of an enslavement history, again, that was a proud moment. I'm, a, I'm married to a black man. That moment had to be internalized, and my daughter was part of that moment, you know. But I think that's where people are stuck at right now, and that becomes problematic because it doesn't allow you to organize. A lot of young people who participated, and the records also show, were also a lot of college students. And you know, part of that is then who believes then that voting will get them that structural change. Well, maybe they didn't want structural change. Maybe they just wanted to, to, to be part of history. But that doesn't mean that they became organizers. And I think that's one of the problems that we're seeing. Mm. So, and I want to jump to Cindy real quick. Um, you're somebody who critiqued very vocally George Bush and got a very positive response from a lot of the people who have hesitations about your critiques of Barack Obama. Could you speak about that a little bit? Um, I think the first six months of 2009 were like my loneliest months of ev ever in my entire life because I went from you know, in, in 2006, well, very shortly after my excursion to Crawford, and when the Democrats regained power in both houses, of course, a very slim majority, and when, um, you know, they were running actually against George Bush in 08. 
And so in 2006, I realized that it's not about George Bush, it's about the system, especially when you get Democratic leadership who told me in 05, Cindy, help us get elected, we'll help you end the war. So we helped them get elected, and what did we help them do? We helped them fund the war, we helped them protect George Bush for all his crimes. And so I thought, it's, it's really the system. And I just started calling George Bush at that time the boil on the ass of democracy. Because, you know, you lance a boil, and if you don't cure the disease, you get another boil. So, um, and you can, you can do whatever you want with that one. <laughs> and so, so I, I, I saw it very little change in rhetoric from Barack Obama. I saw him try to out-Christian McCain. I saw him try to out-tough McCain. And I'm like, if we're going to have a Republican and someone who's trying to be more Republican, you might as well vote for the Republican, if that's, those were your only choices. And so I'm like, I don't want McCain, and I don't want someone that tries to out-McCain McCain to be president. And so I was running against Nancy Pelosi on a very progressive platform and in San Francisco. We went to the last bastion of black uh, neighborhood in, in San, Francisco, San Francisco called Bayview Hunters Point. And I don't know the statistics, Cynthia McKinney does, but most of the people who voted in that community vo went and just voted for Obama. They didn't go to the next line to vote for me. They didn't go to the next line to vote for, or, or, and, and every line, I think we had like 28 um, propositions on, from California to um, county and city propositions. They didn't go, they didn't extend. And those are the actual things that affect their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And now, what do we see a year later? We see the, the profound gentrification of that community. We're, San Francisco is going to become homogenous. San Francisco is already an elitist city where it used to be very diverse. We're losing our diversity. And we have to critique the system. We can't just critique ourselves because there's so many people out there. They watch the media. They, they see that the economy's better. That's what the media tells us. A lot of people say, well, you know, we don't have to go to peace demonstrations because the wars are over. And so if you don't constantly critique the system, people say, well, if the com economy's better, what's wrong with me? It must be me. No, it's not. It's the system. And that isolates everybody. If we think that we're the ones with the problems, then we're isolated from people who we think are doing better than us. So constantly, self-reflection is great, and we should all do it. But we also have to have vocal voices critiquing the system. So I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the course of, of reporting the story that I did for The Nation about young people who worked on the Obama campaign, I found that a lot of them are now working in kind of community, doing community work, not necessarily doing political work. And I wanted to see maybe, Michael, if you had any, any examples or any of the other, uh, the rest of you, have examples of where some of the energy that, that manifested a year ago is now and what you're sort of looking forward to or excited about. I think one of the sad things of, of the first year of the, of the administration is how they have dealt with young people. I think there's so many young people who were involved in the campaign, and I wasn't one of them. I mean, I didn't work in the campaign at all. But there were so many who were involved who, when it came time for security clearances to work inside the administration, they couldn't get them. It took too long. They didn't have a job for six months. They couldn't hold on to wait until they got security clearance. And because of that, a lot of the young people sort of dispersed and have gone in different directions. And I don't think that the administration has yet come out with a very clear agenda on how to work with young people. I know they, they built their Office of Public Engagement to a much larger staff than the previous president, but it hasn't yet really worked uh, hand in hand with young people. So, so I am still inspired by those who are doing work previous to this president, those who are doing work previous uh, to President Bush in the community. Um, and I do believe, and I, and I do agree with Cindy, um, we do have to critique the system, but also I think that we have to continue to push the, 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 the systems that we've created in the community um, that can do just as much change, if not more, 
than the president. All right. Thank you. I would pick up a little on that and say I think that for some, I think for some organizations, the context has changed. Like there may be some more people, but do you feel that there is more a sense of hopefulness that you can actually get something done than necessarily they felt, you know, two, three, four years ago? And that I think is that is that I hear, I hear that differently, you know, from grantees. I, I want to just I want to do pick up on one of the previous points around the system because I, I was struck by because one of the um, in the poems one of the words you talked about was listening to Martin Luther King, and and I forgot who referred to it, but you know folks forget. I mean, Dr. King was not well embraced when the civil rights movement started, and when he came out with that speech that linked militarism, poverty, and racism, <laughs> you know, at Riverside Church. Um, I mean, the New York Times and many, just they, they and many others just disowned him, and they said, "You have you have gone off the deep end. They call them what is your problem?" They call them economists. Well, they were yeah, that's right, and they were ramping up the energy, and that there are some who would argue that. I mean, my I used to be one of the ministers on staff at Riverside, and Dr. James Forbes, the former right. senior minister, he would say, you know, what got him, what got Dr. King killed, was when he started organizing poor people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I'm not sure that we would listen to Dr. King today. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think that, you know, which is why then when we celebrate the King holiday, we get very much stuck on the dream speech right. and do not spend a whole, actually we spend no, no time, time. <laughs> right. really talking about that critical, and when he really drew those connections. And that, you know, like to me, that is really, to me that is the, that's the important critique of the system, and that's, to me, what needs to really power our organizing and our engagement these days. Or when he wrote the book, Chaos to Community. Right. Where he's like, you know what? Integration, cool. It's not my, that's not the issue now. The issue now is poor people, you know? And that mm -hmm. book really shows, like, Malcolm's transition. You know, Malcolm wasn't dangerous in the Nation of Islam. He becomes dangerous when he has a meeting with Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. You know, he becomes dangerous when Che Guevara talks about him at the UN. So listen, on that note, we're going we're gonna to close the panel and open up for Q&A from the audience. So uh, we have folks who are going to be going around with microphones, and if you want to put your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. <laughs> I have one quick thing to say about Obama and young people. In October of 2009 was the first time in, I believe, six years that the military met its recruitment goals. Is that Obama's mm. job program? Well, mm. green job since he's Hi. Uh, on the subject of jobs, um, and people are talking about you know, getting active and pushing Obama and all this other stuff. There are people who are trying to be employed you know, or without work. So it's a little difficult, I think, for people who are trying to find jobs to go and try to get Obama's attention. You know, they're not thinking about trying to get Obama's attention. You know, they're not writing letters to him or whatever. And from the most part, it seems as though the only people that, peop that Obama will listen to is a lobbyist. Right. You know, somebody who will help him do what, you know, function during his next campaign or whatever. So what are your, what do you advise for people who are trying to find employment <laughs> and want to be active, or, or frustrated with what's happening at the same time. Um, I, I have a real quick thing to say about that. You know, when I said that joining the military was Obama's jobs program, I was just half kidding. Maybe I wasn't even kidding. Mm. But you see, that's why people are joining the Taliban, because they pay $8 a day, and they don't have jobs. So what's the difference between joining the US military for a job? for health insurance, for an education benefit, when health insurance and education should be free and um, available to everybody in this country, but then we wouldn't join the military if that happened. Now, speaking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s Poor People campaign, I have a flyer here. I'm starting something in Washington, D.C. on March 13th called Peace of the Action, P-E-A-C-E -E of the Action. 
and we're going to build a camp on the Washington Monument. We're going to call it Camp Out Now. And not only are we going to be an anti-war camp, but we're going to invite people. Washington, D.C. has an enormous homeless, jobless population. As the population grows, the services cut, get cut. So if, as long as you don't have a job, you know, a bus ticket to D.C. from here is $13, or you can hitchhike. Um, well, maybe not. And, <laughs> and come. We will feed people. You, you can stay at our camp. You know, and every day we're going to do actions to shut down the streets, the offices, the buildings. And I don't have any access. I didn't have any access to George Bush. I was in Washington, D.C. on Saturday with a bullhorn at midnight saying, wake up, Obama, bring our troops home. So if we can build that kind of a movement that Dr. King dreamed of and envisioned and, and to not just help poor people, but to end the wars. Ending the wars will bring jobs. It'll bring services. And that's what we have to concentrate on. So let me just encourage everyone to keep their responses quick, just because we want to get to as many questions as possible, and also the questions brief. Anybody else have anything to add to that? End capitalism. <laughs> like, you know what? That was, that was, that was you know, we need, we need to start saying these things. I mean, we're on the cusp of having a movement that could end capitalism, okay? And I, I think one of the important things, too, um, is that we need to figure out a way of how to support each other collectively yes. at this point. Because mm. no matter how many jobs come or how many promises over this green job movement, which to me is just poverty pimping once again, for the most part. And if he was serious about green jobs, he could have at least kept Van Jones, you know. But he got rid of him and Yoshi Sargent. But yeah, I think one of the things is how do we collectively help each other out in these moments? And lastly, to realize many of us, especially us who went to college or like me, I grew up middle class like South Bronx and Westchester. I'm not middle class. And I had to look in the mirror one day and say, there is no middle class. You're not part of it. Get rid of that facade in your mind because then that makes a clear deletion, uh, 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 a, 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 a markation, a line of how and what we organize about. We're not middle class in this country anymore. We're working class and the elite. Yep. Mm. And I just also want to acknowledge that Khalil is on the stage, and you can ask him questions as well. Next question, please. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I think uh, two, two elections just went by that I think are very important. Uh, Bloomberg got elected, and um, uh, what's the uh, guy's name in Massachusetts? Brown. Scott Brown. 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 Brown got elected. Brownie. Now, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think they're important because it, I think it shows that people are really getting out of this thing that um, somehow uh, we're stuck with the Democrats because uh, if we don't vote for them, then uh, we're going to wind up with something uh, even worse. So when, uh, when Bloomberg got elected, despite all the billions of dollars he put in, uh, he got elected mainly because most people just didn't vote. They were so disgusted, they just didn't vote. And despite that, he still just squeaked through, despite his money and everything else. Now, what happened in Massachusetts? Can I, can I ask you to get to the so question? The, so the question is this. Um, do you think that it is really possible, I mean, to ch uh, change the Democratic Party uh, from within, to uh, keep pressuring Obama and the Democrats to uh, change? If we keep uh, supporting the Democratic Party, if we keep voting for them, aren't they just going to take, uh, take us for granted? So... I would love to jump in. Um, I, I, I had a, a radio interview this morning, and the host continuously asked me, you know, what was I still hopeful about Barack Obama? And, I, and, and I'm not thinking about Barack Obama, even though I wrote 100 poems. I'm not thinking about for purchase outside. I'm not thinking about Barack Obama um, for, to think about Barack Obama. I'm thinking about Barack Obama to think about people and to think about myself, to reflect what's going on with me and what's going on with people in the world, right? So as far as just if we took this New York City election with Bloomberg, right, if we had already 
relationships with a substantial population in New York City who we could get to mobilize and go out there and, 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 and support whatever candidate we believe needs to be in office, then that's what we would, we would have been able to do. You know, how many, there's a bunch of teachers in here. I work with young people. You can't go to young people and say, well, you know, pro propaganda. You can't be like, look, you, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. You gotta build a relationship, right? And that is the grounds for development with, for, with them and the development of an analysis larger you can't try to give them an analysis you know what i mean and i think too many times when we engage our communities we are engaging them with our analysis like look this is the answer right and then they don't get involved and we're like what's wrong with them mm. um the the party party Elizabeth. just very quickly the party party the pot smoking um hippie party Clothing optional. Our slogan is revolution because at this point, reform's too hard. <laughs> if, I, make, make. If, if I could mm. just <laughs> say something to that point. Um, I thought one of the great line I thought the president said in his acceptance or his the night of the, inaugur the, night of the election um, was that this is not the change that we seek, yet the opportunity to make the change that we want. I think for a lot of us, like the reverend said before, we felt because we elected him, the change happened. And so we forgot about Billy Thompson in New York that lost by four points, yet he got outspent 10 to 1. We forgot. We didn't show up. We said, oh, we're good. We got the president. We're good. So I do think we have to take a moment and say, wait a second, the work has just begun. Let us keep doing the work. I don't think people forgot. I just don't think William Thompson inspired the people. <laughs> you know, again, you're, you're, you're going back to the Democratic Party. The, the question is, then why is the Democratic Party the party that keeps the Green Party off the ballot with its millions of dollars? Why is it that the Democratic Party continues to actually do more damage than the Republican parties? The, the Republicans are going to tell you what they do, that you're a straight Negro. They're going to yell at your you know, address and how they do, and they're going to be very clear. Yes, they're never going to deviate. Sort of the, in the Supreme Court. I don't, Sonia Sotomayor is Boricua from down the street where I live, Bronx River Houses. I think it was a beautiful moment. But Republican I don't think Sonia, do Sonia Sotomayor is not going to vote against the death penalty. Sonia Sotomayor, you know, we, these people yeah. who are symbolic, how do, we, how do I know if you read her previous work, then you know that most likely she is going to tend to vote against ending the death penalty. But she'll keep the woman's right to See, choose. What she'll keep Lumia? a woman's right to choose that's not enough for what women. What about Lumia? That, what about Mumia? What about making Puerto Rico? What about you talking well, I, about Puerto okay, Rico guys, being independent? Take, yeah. Let's take another Moderator. question. Let's keep the. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they're moments. These are symbolic moments. These are not people that are changing the material yeah, conditions. One one, okay. Okay. Right, right over here. Oh, right now. <laughs> hey, what's up? Um, do I have a statement more than a question? Is that cool? Go for I, it. <laughs> no, really? Make it quick. Okay. Um, I'm a Colombian. Um, for the first time, my Colombian family in Cartagena is about to see U.S. soldiers. Are you so for me, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to go through that, like, you know, reflecting and, and trying to be cordial. <laughs> I'm already looking at people like, yo, you walk in a thin line between being my enemy of my family, personally. And that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I think that needs to be said. And I, I don't mean to alienate people or make people feel intimidated or anything. Uh, I mean, I, I love all you people. I love New Yorkers. I love everyone on that stage. But that's where I'm at right now. Mm. You know? For the next 10 years, really? I mean, seriously? And, we, you know, the 60s and the 70s, we had our leaders. We respected them. You know, whenever they got arrested, we were out. Not me. <laughs> I'm too young. But we, we have them today, and we need to respect them. And that's, that's all I'm saying. You know, Mami Abu Jamal gave his orders. We followed, so most of us didn't. You know, we have leaders on this stage, and then we need to do that. Follow what, what other revolutionaries around the world say. Um, unity, steadfastness, and resistance to liberty. Simple, 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 simple rules. That's all I gotta say, I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Colombiano. <laughs> yeah, um, <coughs> very briefly, Sonia Sotomayor did vote in a, in a uh, decision announced yesterday to reinstate the death penalty for Mumia. So it's not a question of what she should do. Shameful. She will do. We know what she would it's do. Shameful. All right. 
Ah. So uh, Barack Obama was really sort of labeled by the mass media as the, as the hip hop candidate, as the first hip hop candidate, right? And uh, I think that was largely because he was a young, hip man of color and, you know, pop rappers across the board co-signed him. Um, I feel like I read on DVD.com, right, that the real hip hop candidates were Cynthia McKinney yeah, and Rosa Clemente. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I, it was in January last year when I read your, your, your platform, Rosa, that I was like, yes, this is the hip hop candidate and this is what hip hop culture represents on a, on a political platform level. So my question is, what's, what's, what's the repercussion of having uh, a hip hop candidate who's not really <laughs> representative of the hip hop movement in office, successfully elected and you know, misrepresenting this culture at large? Well, I mean, there's two quick aspects to it. First of all, it's because me and Cynthia were women. You know, straight up, we weren't covered as fairly um, by the mass media, the independent media, the black media, the Latino media. But particularly within hip hop, you know, when I accepted Cynthia's um, call and then the Green Party nominated me, I think for some folks in the Green Party it was like, hip hop, what does this mean? And when I made my nomination speech, I, I said this is not about Rosa Clemente, this is about a platform that the hip hop generation set in 2004 at the National Hip Hop Political Convention, this is what we want. This is about an idea that the Rockefeller drug laws when they ended did not free people. I don't care how they try to spin it, I worked on that for years and the deal that um, Benjamin Chavis Muhammad made and Russell Simmons that day when they went to meet with Pataki allowed 437 people to come out instead of 14,000. So in saying that, I think part of it is sexism. I think a lot of the rappers and the money makers within hip hop um, wanted Barack Obama to be their candidate because they believe in the Democratic Party. You know, and then lastly, um, I feel just as good now as I felt last year. I feel no disappointment because to me, the person that should have been in the White House with then congressional and Senate people to follow was Cynthia McKinney. You know, and it's hard for me to sometimes be at that space where people, where I got to say, back up, Rosa. You got to re-engage on a very grassroots level of what that means. It's also about Barack mm. Obama being the peace candidate. You know, what, what really gets me is that symbol that's the Obama sticker with the O as a peace sign. You know, what the heck is that all about? And so that was the, that was the part of the $750 million propaganda campaign that um, Wall Street, you know, he's the greatest story ever sold. And so it's, it's the hopenosis of change. You know, we were hypnotized about change. That's why people think they don't have to be engaged, because he's all about change. I think Cindy needs to be a rapper. And actually, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to wrap things up. On that First note. white grandma rapper. Yeah. I want to thank all of you. This is a really, really wonderful panel. Lots of interesting perspectives. To Khalil for uh, his wonderful, wonderful poetry. <laughs> Michael Skolnick, thank you so much. You. You to, would you like to add anything? Cl any closing remarks? I know I'd be the only one here who would support Barack Obama, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a very healthy debate. I, I, and what, I, what, I, what I, I take from this and what I learn from this, and, and I appreciate uh, the, the really incredible remarks, um, is that uh, we're all on the same team. We all want a better America. We all want a better communities uh, that we live in. Um, so I appreciate, uh, uh, Rosa, what you said, uh, and the Reverend and Cynthia, um, because it makes me a better person and, 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 and challenges me. So, so thank you. Mm. All right. You really went after my boss. <laughs> Miss <laughs> Rosa Clemente. Listen, Holly, I'm going to tell you something. I went after your boss in 2001 when I proudly wrote an article called Russell Simmons is not hip hop. And it's not, it's not just about Russell. It isn't. And I just want to say a couple of things. My professor, Dr. Gordon, always taught me we debate ideas and not people. And that I would like an end to America as we know it. And then lastly, on the flip side, I did neglect to say that within hip hop, 
some people that had some media power, like a Kim Osorio, who was with Global Grind, and also BET, or Jeff Johnson, purposely put themselves on the line to make sure a message got out. And that needs to be appreciated. Talib Kweli supported Barack Obama, but he wrote a song for me and Cynthia. That's to be supported. And then there were a lot of people within Independista Puerto Rican communities that said, Rosa, I know you're on the ballot, but you know me, I ain't voting in this system but that they still support the work that we're trying to do. And I think I agree with you that at this point, we're all in this together. Or we're like, it's like laws, live together, die alone. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend John Vaughn. I think that a lot of what is, um, what's actually gonna be called for <clears throat> is more courageous action. Um, and that I remember once, I remember once preaching a sermon um, that talked about organizing. When you really are organizing, it actually is a life and death activity because when you're actually really beginning to make a change, you may get taken out. <laughs> and so I think that we need to be under, no matter who is president and who is in what place, we need to be under no illusions that this will not, the challenges that we face are going to call for some courageous action. You know, not just among the people that sit on this stage and some of the others, but courageous action by many of us. And, and so I would leave that as a call, not only, you know, as I preach to myself, but I think a call for all of us. It is a time for courageous action. All right, and now I want to thank Cindy Sheehan. Um, well, you know, it is courageous because I, I've been at protests, and the protests I'm going to now, the police state is getting scarier. I was at the G20 in Pittsburgh. I got tear gas. I got shot with a sound cannon. They shot at me with rubber bullets. Lucky for them, they never hit me because I would have been, oh, no, you didn't. I'm gonna, <laughs> you better have a backup real bullet in that gun because I'm coming after you. But um, I'm not even kidding, you know? How, how dare you? How dare you protect the ruling class while pe members of your own class are out here trying to exercise our freedom of speech. You know, I said in the green room, what a wonderful world. The world's only going to change when they turn their, their faces to them and away from us and help us put them in jail, help us arrest George Bush, Dick Cheney, and all the ruling class <laughs> elite. That's when the world is going to change. But anyway, I got kind of off on the, on the tangent there. Come to Washington, D.C. If you can come for a day, a week, a month, or until the troops start coming home. Come to um, Camp Out now for peace of the action. Be with us because the, the robber class, the ruling class, they want to divide us. They want to make, make us think that we're more different than we are the same. It's called divide and conquer. So we need everybody out there. I, you know, I need you standing with me because the, they know we have numbers. We have 300 million people, and they have a few thousand. So stand together. And so on that note, it's time for some action. And so we're going to have Khalil talk about his, uh, read his open letter to Barack, and then uh, he will take it from here. So uh, because of time, we're going to actually uh, skip that, the letter part. In the beginning of the book, um, I wrote a letter to Barack Obama. Um, and we have a campaign now that we're launching to get people to write letters to Barack Obama. And one of the reasons is we want people to re-engage. We feel like a lot of people, once he, uh, he was elected, disengaged. And we want people to re-engage. And we don't take this moment lightly. It is, it is something happened when you have a, a black man become the president of the United States of America with the history of the United States of America. That, that was a moment. 
um, that was weighty for all of us, you know, what, what ways did we process that? What, what ways did we deal with that, you know? Um, what if we all took a, took a moment to stop and write a, a, a poem about the moment or a hundred poems or, or write a letter about the moment? Um, and it's just really a, just a way we think people can just re-engage, right, in the conversations. So um, you saw some people wrote their Dear Barack's. We have a website, darebarack.mvmt.com. Um, and we're just going to do a couple poems, right, to finish out? Okay. So um, we have a lot of thank yous. We have a long list of thank yous. I'm going to try to be quick. Can we give a big round of applause for our moderator, Elizabeth <laughs> Mendez Berry? We're, we're super, super thankful for the space, so please give it up for Jerome L. Green, performance space staff. They really were, were super with us. We had a bunch of sponsors. NICOR, NICOR is in the house. We had Cold Pink, a sponsor. Urban Word NYC was a sponsor. Uh-oh. Um, One Soul MVMT was also a sponsor, and MVMT um, really put this event together. Um, we had a lot of partners helping us along the way, Rolando Brown, Michael Cordero, Chelsea Gregory, Sarah Gregory, James Bartlett, um, Justin Caitlin Meissner, who did the, the artwork, she's in here. Um, we had Michael Primo, who consulted with us on the Dear Barack campaign. Hopefully we'll work, keep working together. We have Ashley and Salome, I saw them walk in. They were c consultants in the project. So please, a round of applause. Yaya, my good brother Yaya. Thank you for being here. A lot of staff that helped us. So um, we want to leave kind of close to on time. So I'm going to be real quick. The president speaks to us as if we are adults. Maybe this will help us finally grow up. People complain about the rhetoric of our president. I have found most rhetoric happens off camera. People who have not created anything with well-stated positions. I may be president of this club. Today, I resign. Without even knowing what I will do next, I will make sure my work stays ahead of my words. Which member of this, our human family, is without blame for the problems we face? Tell me, who of us will be willing to point the finger at themselves and say, I will tend this garden? So, um, and I guess, because it's only quite appropriate, um, this event was the result of our, me and my wife Julia's first year of marriage, definitely. <laughs> um, so here we go. My wife calls herself a mutt too. Like you, she finds her face at the intersection of many identities. Like you, she has battled the either or black or white lines trying to dissect her. Like you, she lives in the both and neither, claiming all of who she is. Maybe Barack will be future slang for multicultural and proud. So that's what you do. Thank you, the People's Inauguration. Thank you very much. Um, let's please give one last round of applause to our panel. Um, oh. And you could definitely buy books on your way out. And you should. And you should. And write a letter. And, and write a letter. Everybody in this room writes one letter and gets back. Friends, we're well on our way. Check out dearbrock.mbmt.com and get your letters. Get them to us and help us start this project. Buy a book. Write a letter. <laughs>